Um, it is wonderful to see everybody here. Let me start by thanking the uh, administration and the personnel at Farmingdale for hosting us today. And I have the uh, distinct pleasure of doing a couple of different things, one of which is I get to do some acknowledgments. And Senator Martins, you're not going to get mad at me for putting on my glasses because I, I know who you are, but I've got to make sure I get everything else right. So uh, we are joined today by, and I did not get a chance to properly say hello, by Commissioner Arlene Gonzalez-Sanchez from Oasis. <laughs> Commissioner, please stand up. You know, on the type of work that she does, this is a bellwether day, so congratulations to you. Now, I have joined by a number of our colleagues today in no particular order, and it has nothing to do with age or beauty or anything else like that. I'm going to start with Senator Phil Boyle. Senator Phil, Phil Boyle. Coming all the way from the north down south, Senator David Carlucci. A gentleman who has been, you know what, I, I was remiss in not saying this. Senator Boyle did hearings a couple of years ago. He did, yeah, he did, he did, yep. And truly, I think that was the catalyst for a lot of what we're seeing today. Uh, Senator Boyle did about a dozen statewide hearings with, I say, Christine Geed and his staff here, like this, all around the state, and in support uh, and with all of our colleagues and one of our newest members who got elected in 2014, Senator Terrence Murphy, hailing all the way from the Hudson Valley. A gentleman who uh, essentially needs no introduction, but has a stellar career, chair of the Health Committee for over 20 years, and a legit, and I mean legit, expert in health care, and that's Senator Kemp Hannon. Kemp, good to see you here. all the way from just across the border in Nassau County, straddling where we are today, the Chair of the Education Committee, Senator Carl Marcellino. And one of our numerous members as well, a gentleman who has distinguished himself in a lot of different ways, including um, having a two-year-old son at this point, and that's Senator Michael Venditto. And in some respects, again, somebody who needs no introduction, who is here, has been a fantastic county executive, a very dear friend of the governor, Edmund Gowner, Nassau County Executive. <laughs> and I know we have people who are going to do other introductions, but I have the pleasure of introducing a lady who is really uh, is new on the scene, but she is a Nassau County District Attorney, Madeline Singus. Now, I did not get a chance to say hello to these people property. I do see one of our colleagues from Suffolk County. I'm going to skip over and do her first, Legislator Sarah Anker from Suffolk County. <laughs> Legislator Ellen Birnbaum from Nassau County. Ellen, nice to see you here. And we have a variety of other introductions, but City Councilwoman Anissa Moore from Long Beach. Okay. All right, so here's my charge. I get to make some comments, and I'm going to introduce one of my colleagues from the Assembly. Today is a fantastic day. And today is a fantastic day, and I see one of my constituents, Linda Ventura, in the audience. And you know what? It's a fantastic day, but it's bittersweet. So I'm 55 years old, and I think uh, Governor is just a little bit older than I am, but um, he's definitely more mature than I am. But I would say this. You know, when we were growing up, when you talked about drugs and addiction and alcohol and things like that, there were certain ways that you talked about things. Today we're in a completely different world. And to his credit, the governor, Jeff Reynolds, people like that, who are all out there in the field, every time we try and do something right, the target moves. Government gets involved, whether it's Kemp Hannon or our colleagues who work in government. You try and figure out laws, Tom Croce, and you say, this is the way we're going to do things. And just as we sign something into law and the governor gets plaudited for what he does, the bad guys figure a way to get around it. So I'm just putting it in context. When I was growing up, there was no question that people were doing drugs. But a lot of people were doing, you know, smoking pot or marijuana and stuff like that. When you talked about LSD or cocaine or heroin, that was like way, way out there. Today, I think we're at a point where the opportunity, the access, the cost, the availability, the potency, 
When you talk to parents, it goes like that. One time and it's over. So I think for every one of us, city council members, county legislators, members of the assembly, county executive, clearly the governor of the state of New York, and my colleagues in the state senate, whether it's Terrence Murphy or Rob Ward or George Amador or Phil Boyle, we all care about these things. And it knows no political bounds. It knows no demographics. knows no income barriers. doesn't matter whether you're in Plattsburgh or the Mohawk Valley or Utica or the Southern Tier, wherever it may be in, in the state of New York, Senator Martin's district, who's been outspoken in these areas, this is a plague and a scourge that affects every single family, every single day, no matter what we try and do. So we're at a juncture now where I think we can take some credit, some credit, because we still have a lot of work to do. To his credit, the governor of the state of New York worked with us very closely to appropriate money in the budget. And for all of you who work in the field, we can have the greatest ideas in the world. But if we don't back it up with money, it doesn't mean anything. And how you spend it and where, well. <laughs> Governor, you see how smart I'm getting? As long as we put money in the budget, we're going to be in a good spot. So to all the people who work in the field, uh, we want to make sure that you believe in what we're doing. Now, the governor has talked about integrity, trust, honor, and service in government. We can demonstrate that by leading. And I'm proud to work with all of my colleagues across both sides of the political aisle. And I think we're at a crossroads. And we've made what I would call a New York darn good start. And you need leadership. And that leadership comes from a lot of the people in this room, especially the governor of the state of New York. So we're at a time where we can celebrate and at the same time recognize how much more work we need to do. Having said that, there are a lot of people who can get up here today. I want to, um, before I introduce Assemblyman Levine, 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 whatever, okay, whatever makes him happy, um, he's going to introduce a number of our colleagues. I want to thank my colleagues, and I want to thank the advocates, and more importantly than anything else, I want to thank the parents. I want to thank the parents. And... I don't think anyone's going to get hurt or offended by me saying this. There is nothing more pure than a parent's love for a child. There is nothing more poignant and nothing sadder when you lose a child. I've seen the pictures. I've had people bring ashes to my office. No, but you know what? That's real life. That's real life. That's the stuff the governor understands and our colleagues. So having said that, let me introduce our assemblyman for this area, Assemblyman Charles Levine, to make other introductions. Thank you. Quick reintroduction. My name is uh, Levine. <laughs> spelled funny, but if your grandfather couldn't read or write, your name might be spelled, fu spelled funny, and maybe as well. Um, thank you, John. Now, I want to wish everyone a good afternoon. I also want to um, offer a special recognition and acknowledgement to Dr. Hubert Keene, the, the president of this outstanding uh, institution who... who we are delighted will be at Nassau Community College. Dr. Keene, thanks for what you've done. And I also want to recognize some of my colleagues from the State Assembly, and I'm going to name their names, and please hold applause if, if you're going to applaud for them at all, but hold the applause until, uh, until we're done. Uh, so we have here today uh, Al Graff. Al, why don't you stand up? Andy Rea. You've got to hold your applause unless that's a special rooting section. Chad Lupinacci. Dave McDonough. Joe Saladino, Mike Fitzpatrick. Mike, you don't want to sit with the rest of them. But, oh, no, you are sitting with some of them. Uh, Dean Murray. Tom McKevitt is here as well. And uh, our colleague, Assemblywoman uh, Kimberly Jean-Pierre. All right, now let's have some...
Our gathering here this day sends a powerful and a persuasive message of what can be accomplished when compassion, governmental commitment, and executive leadership intersect. And while I wish, and I truly do wish, that I did not know this all too well from my own family experience, but addiction is a remarkable challenge, and it's a challenge that's difficult for anyone to overcome. And heroin and opioid addiction is especially alarming because it practices no discrimination whatsoever. Last year, more than 17,000 people on Long Island alone were admitted for opioid abuse. That's 17,000 daughters, 17,000 of our sons, friends and loved ones of every race, every education level, and every income. It's also 17,000 of our families. Our story is hardly unique. It is, in fact, repeated in countless communities across New York State and across our entire nation. But it is often during these times of adversity that we are, we are able to find our greatest strength. And that's a concept and a philosophy that is uniquely American. And it's also, at the same time, a philosophy and a concept that is what New York State is all about. Because it is right here in New York State that we have a true leader in Governor Andrew Cuomo, whose commitment to fighting for community and against heroin and opioid addiction over the past years is already helping to protect and save thousands of lives. But it was clear that more was needed. More had to be done. Now, because Democrats and Republicans in New York State showed Washington what real progress looks like, Governor Cuomo will today sign legislation that puts into motion our nation's most aggressive and most comprehensive plan to combat heroin and opioid addiction. Our ability, that's, that's a good applause line. Thank you. Our ability to work together for the greater good will literally save lives and it will preserve the futures of countless New Yorkers and their families. I want to take a moment to thank my colleagues in the legislature, members of the task force, and Governor Cuomo for his leadership on this critical issue. I now want to introduce to you someone who has seen the effect heroin addiction and other types of addiction can have on a family and on community. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Anthony Rizzuto, who will share his experience. Thank you. I want to acknowledge my colleague. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, this is a big day for families and communities on Long Island, and all over New York State, for that matter. You know, we fought tirelessly to combat this uh, heroin and opioid epidemic. We did it. It's done. <clears throat> Thanks to the Senate, the Assembly, Governor Cuomo. Um, I've said this from the beginning. This is a we problem, and it requires a we solution. No one is exempt from this. I know all too well the devastation and havoc addiction can wreak on not one person's life, but on their families, friends, and society as a whole. I'm a person in long-term recovery for the last 23 years. Thank you. When I was asked to speak here, I'm saying, how did that happen? How do I go from the shell of a human being 23 years ago my wife four months pregnant with our first child, to being asked to speak here today. And I'll tell you, um, I think the answer to that, first and foremost, is my Father in Heaven. Secondly, is treatment and recovery. In my particular case, 12-step was a big part of it. You know, today, because I'm sober, it allows me to be a father. It allows me to be a husband. 
It allows me to be a brother and a son. Not everyone has had that opportunity, unfortunately. When I first got sober, I worked to build a foundation. After some time, I tried to help those around me and to make my community and world a better place. After helping friends and neighbors on their journey towards sobriety and after hearing the profound impact on their lives, I decided to change my career. I went from being in business for myself to becoming a counselor. And it stemmed from the gratitude that I had of being free from the bondage of addiction. I will tell you since that point, I've had the opportunity to meet some incredible people. And here's what I will say. In 2001, I came into this field. When I came into this field, so I've been in the field for about 15 years working for Seafield. In that time frame, I have got to meet some incredible people. Uh, when the heroin epidemic first hit, I started hearing of people dying from this addiction. And unfortunately, I got to see the pain on the face of a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister. I just couldn't stand by. Just doing my job was not enough. And I know I felt that way. I know Jeff Reynolds felt that way. I know Nancy Beckett Lawless felt that way. Claudia Ragney felt that way. Gary Butchner and a whole bunch of us that all came together and said, status quo is unacceptable. And we got together to start making change. I had the opportunity to meet some of the most incredible people in my life. And I'm 54 years old. Not quite your age, but close. <laughs> so I had an opportunity to meet people like Linda Ventura, who lost her son and was willing to take that pain and come up to Albany. I got to meet people like Terry Kroll, who, as far as I'm concerned, was one of the first ones that I recognized who had lost her son to an unintentional overdose and would be up and up and up in Albany constantly in Washington at the Fed Up rally. I mean, it's incredible what this woman has done. And I got to meet a Claudia Frizzell, who's lost two members of her family. And I got to see the devastation, and I started seeing all of these people that were willing to leave work and do whatever they had to do. That inspired me. It inspired me to start an organization called FIST, Families in Support of Treatment. Because of that organization, we were able to unify people. We were able to unify treatment professionals. We were able to unify families that had uh, a, a, a child that had died or a loved one that had died, people who were in recovery, families that were struggling with a loved one's addiction, and the person that was so struggling themselves. We were able to unite everybody. And with that, we were able to make some change. I can tell you people like Nora Milligan, who unfortunately has gone through so much, so many treatment attempts with her son, you know, and just joined the fight and came in, and her voice is never to not be heard. Paulette Felipe, who lost a 15-year-old grandson. This woman got on the bus with us and came up there and with the best of us, she was running in there and letting her voice be heard. Karen McMahon, Dale and Beth Rydell. I mean, I can go on and on and on. I see Denise Muir. I mean, I can go on and on with the amount of people. These are our neighbors. These are our kids. These are our families. And with that, we started coming together. When I founded this organization called Families in Support of Treatment, we organized, like I said, the individuals and recovery providers, prevention specialists, various other sections of the community to advocate for those struggling with addiction and their families. I've seen and experienced firsthand the destruction that occurs when our community does not have access to the treatment that services necessary to put New Yorkers on a path to recovery. At FIST, we work to help families navigate the system. When a family is in crisis, they don't know where to go. They don't know who to call. They don't know which one's good and which one's not good. That's a service that we look to provide. Thankfully, FIST and many other organizations, like Steve Chasman from LICAT and Jeff Reynolds, Rich Buckman from Lyra, John Coppola from ASAP, Bob Lindsay and For New York, Paige Pierce and Families Together, we all united to make a difference. And through the grace of God and the support of all of the families, and last but not least, 
the governor, the Senate, and the Assembly, this was able to happen. For years, well, what I want to say is, thankfully, we found the willing partner in Governor Cuomo. For years, Governor Cuomo has led the way in combating heroin and opioid addiction in New York and continues to be a national leader on this issue. From implementing the comprehensive iStop law to better track and monitor prescription drugs to signing the landmark combat heroin legislation in 2014 to launching a public awareness campaign to educate New Yorkers on the dangers of opioid abuse, there has been no one more committed to stemming the tide of addiction in New York than Governor Cuomo. The governor has also led the way in increasing access to life-saving overdose reversal medications, supporting the training of over 112,000 individuals and communities across the state. The governor is a true friend and a champion of New York's families and continues to work tirelessly to protect the public health and safety. And before I forget, Rob Kent, Peggy Beno, Arlene Sanchez, God bless you for what you've done. And now it is what my great pleasure to introduce a man who has demonstrated unparalleled leadership on this vital issue. Please join me in welcoming the 56th Governor of New York State, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, pleasure to be back on Long Island with so many friends uh, on, on an issue that uh, has, has been a long time coming for government and society to address uh, this issue. So let me begin by congratulating everybody in this room because this was a long, hard road, uh, but we came out at a good place. Uh, first, to my colleagues in the legislature, they're all in a good mood because they're out of Albany. That's what this is today. You see a certain giddiness among them. The legislative session goes from January to June, basically. Uh, and then after June, we just finished the session, so people are back home. Uh, Senator Flanagan is the leader for the Senate, so he bears responsibility. Uh, and I found a... a peculiar but uh, very effective way of getting Senator Flanagan to shorten the session, because the shorter the session, the faster we get done, the better for me. What I started doing towards the end was mandatory daily meetings with me, if you wanted to stay in Albany. And Senator Flanagan, because that's a, you know, worse than uh, any punishment you could come up with, spending three hours a day with me, Senator Flanagan miraculously came up with a global resolution, wrapped up the whole session, we ended on time, and we had one of the best sessions in history. Let's give Senator Flanagan a big round of applause. <laughs> Assemblyman Levine and the members of the Assembly, pleasure to be with you. Your County Executive Ed Mangano and his better half, Linda Mangano, who spoke to me about this issue about a year ago, uh, and said, and she was exactly right, it's growing, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, we have to do something, we have to do something together. She was exactly right. Linda Mangano, thank you very much. <laughs> now, we had a good uh, legislative session. We got a lot of good things done. We really did. We passed something called paid family leave, the best paid family leave policy in the United States of America. It exists right here in the state of New York, which will allow people to spend time at home when they have a child or when they have an, an illness. More money for education than ever before in the history of the state of New York. $25 billion. first state in the nation to mandate that schools test their water for lead. That's the great state of New York. We're doing something about what they call zombie properties. Zombie properties are those homes that are somewhere between foreclosure by the bank and ownership, and they deteriorate and they take down a whole community. We passed le legislation that expedites the disposition of zombie homes. Uh, so we did a lot of good work. We also 
uh, here's something you can always win a bet on. Uh, the state of New York cut taxes for the middle class, people up to $300,000, so it's a very wide middle class, uh, cut taxes to the lowest rate in 70 years, believe it or not. That's what we did in Albany. And you can always win a bet on that because nobody really believes that government cuts taxes. You know, it's one of those things that people just don't think is possible. It's like an amicable divorce. You know, it can't happen. Otherwise, you wouldn't be getting a divorce if it was amicable. Uh, but we actually cut taxes. So we did a lot of great work. But I think the piece of legislation that is going to affect the most people is what we have done here on heroin and opioid overdose. It is a crisis. It's a crisis in this state. It's a crisis in this country. It's a crisis where the numbers are frightening. Suffolk County led the state in the number of opiate overdoses. Out of 62 counties, Suffolk County was number one. Nassau and Suffolk, 88 opioid-related deaths in 2003, 2014, 319. The numbers are increasing exponentially. And nothing that we've done thus far has made a difference. 85,000 people hospitalized with opioid overdoses. And if it wasn't for Narcan, we would have lost even more lives. It's now gotten... So the numbers are frightening. Uh, in the state, uh, it is not as bad as it is on Long Island, where the numbers are actually worse, but it's bad all throughout the state. Uh, and in truth, I kudos to the Senate. The Senate raised this issue very early on. Senator Flanagan raised the issue very early on. Uh, being from Long Island, he knew it firsthand. Senator Terrence Murphy and Senator Phil Boyle were on a task force that went all across the state uh, working on this, along with members of the Assembly. They came up with a really intelligent plan, and that's the plan that we're enacting into legislation with the appropriate funding. So let's give them a round of applause for the good work they did. I'd also like to say to Mr. Rizzuto's point, the energy, uh, when, you, when you saw the hearings of the task force, the energy in this issue came from a number of sources. It came from the healthcare community, came from people who worked in substance abuse. But I think the energy and the power, most of all, came from parents who had lost a child. And... Mr. Rizzuto was going through the names, but Claudia Frizzell and Linda Ventura and Susan Salomon and Terry Kroll and Lori Carbonara and Paulette Philippe, Dale and Beth Rydell, Dorothy Johnson, Tracy Judd, Victoria Frizzell, to take the pain of losing a child, which must be, I can't even imagine that pain, because it is unnatural. We have loss in life. We lose parents, we lose brothers, we lose sisters, but there's a, there's a cycle to life. It is unnatural to lose a child. Parents don't bury children. And I have such respect for people who went through that situation and took the pain and brought it to a positive place and took the pain and said, I'm going to do something good with this and I'm going to make sure other people don't go through what I went through. What a testament to their integrity and their character, and that's what drove this movement, and we should thank them. The legislation we passed is comprehensive and addresses uh, both the parts of uh, um, the addiction itself, creating the addiction, and treatment. First step, had us deal with the insurance companies. Because the insurance companies are in the business of providing health care. I was the attorney general before I was governor. 
And I had a lot of interactions with the insurance companies, which means I sued them a lot. That's, those are the interactions you have when you're an attorney general. Uh, why? Because they are in the business of providing health care. If they don't have to pay for a service, they don't want to pay for service. Uh, if they don't have to pay for coverage, they don't want to pay for coverage. So one of the initial problems is you have a person who is overdosed on heroin. They're in a critical position. You call the insurance company and say, I want them to get treatment. And the insurance company says, well, hold on, not so fast. We have to approve it first. We have to have our professional look. I want to look at the records. We want to get a second opinion. We want to get a doctor. And you don't have that luxury when you have a person in crisis. That person needs treatment. They need it today. They don't need it in a week. So in our law, we passed a first in the nation. The decision whether or not a person will, requires treatment will not be made by the insurance company in New York State. It will be made by a doctor. And we have, we have a medical protocol that will be answered by a physician. And if that person meets the criteria as established by a pure medical, a pure medical protocol, they will get treatment immediately, whether or not the insurance company <laughs> likes it. Period. Second... Second, by the current law, a parent can only have an institution hold a child against their will if that child's over 18 for 48 hours. Now, this is a delicate balance because over 18, you have civil rights, you have civil liberties. On the other hand, you have parents who are at their wit's end who are afraid if their child isn't in a facility, the child is going to hurt themselves. And we've increased the 48 hours involuntary holding to 72 hours, which is what the medical professionals say is the legitimate amount of time. Third, we have a prescription mania in this society. We have doctors who are prescribing opioids and over-prescribing opioids uh, with a frequency that is alarming. My 20-year-old daughter came back from getting her tonsils taken out, a 30-day supply of opioids. Why would you give a 20-year-old a 30-day supply? If you took the 30-day supply, you may very well be on your way to a problem at the end of 30 days, or you have a 30-day supply which is very valuable and can be sold on the street. Uh, there was never a reason for it. And uh, I've always been, frankly, uh, somewhat critical of the relationship between the medical community and the pharmaceutical community. It's a little too cozy for my taste. This law says there is no 30-day prescription. A doctor cannot write more than a seven-day prescription and refill it if you have to. And the, the fourth main element is we didn't have enough treatment beds in this state. And if a person is ready to go into treatment, they have to go into treatment in that moment. Mandatory treatment, forced treatment doesn't work. You can't force a person to go into treatment. They have to want to go. They have to understand that they need to make these changes. But when they are there, when they're at the bottom and they're willing to go in, you have to get them in literally in that moment. You literally have to seize the moment. We have situations now where you'll have a person who's ready to go into treatment. You call a treatment facility. They say, call back in a month. Maybe we'll have a bed. It doesn't work that way. The person may be gone in a month. We need more treatment capacity. This, this bill funds 2,500 more slots statewide. So we're going to have the treatment capacity we need. And let me say this, the, the best test of government, in my opinion, 
is how government responds to a crisis. Because that's really when you need government, right? What is government? Government is, government is we. Government is the vehicle that gets things done that you can't get done for yourself. And how government responds to a crisis is the telltale sign. Whether it's terrorism, whether it's a snowstorm, whether it's 9-11, whatever it is. How government responds. And we have a crisis with heroin. And I have to tell you that this legislature came together. They worked together, the Assembly and the Senate. It was no, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. There was no partisanship. There was no pride of authorship. They came together. They went around the state. They wrote a really remarkably intelligent report. The White House just said they want to use our state's model as a national model to show other states. And the credit goes to the Senate and the Assembly for getting this legislation done. I'm proud of what they did. It's not going to be solved by government alone. It is going to take all of us. It's going to take the law enforcement community and the police and the educators, parents, citizens, neighbors, family. But now we have the tools on the table to make a real difference. We don't have to lose any more lives. Let's come together. Let's solve this problem. Let's solve our young people. And thank you and God bless you. Let's sign the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please remain seated for the bill signing. Please remain seated for the bill signing.